Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a, an opportunity to be selfish. Um, it means that I can present some ideas that uh, I'm trying to get clear in my mind and uh, get some feedback before I put them uh, in print so that if there are some obvious mistakes, uh, two favors from the audience. One, point them out. Two, be gentle <laughs> because <laughs> it is work in progress. Um, with that out of the way, uh, a couple of things so that you know where this talk might be uh, positioned. First of all, uh, during the talk I will not draw any distinction uh, between AI and uh, smart technologies. Um, there might be a distinction to be made, uh, but this is not a talk where that distinction will be made. Um, secondly, Selm might be somewhere, if it's not, uh, there you are. Uh, you can uh, uh, probably read this talk as um, a continuation of what Selm uh, uh, introduced yesterday. So uh, I hope you will not take offense if I define it a uh, Selmian kind of talk. Uh, we'll see how much we agree, the two of us, uh, along these lines. Um, but I have uh, I have to say, or rather confess, that although I would not argue for it, uh, what lies behind uh, my presentation is um, kind of a, a strong, weak AI position that uh, we discussed uh, with some yesterday. Um, finally, I hope that the time uh, at our disposal will allow for some question and answers for the reasons I introduced at the beginning. Um, there might be some mistakes, God forbid, in which case, uh, please do tell me where I got it wrong. Now, let me um, just uh, outline first um, the very general map of the talk. First of all, I will tell you a little bit more about this enveloping idea. It's quite simple. Um, the fancy terminology just uh, hides the simplicity of the thought. So that will be uh, the first task. The second task uh, will be to highlight some philosophical questions that are raised by a <coughs> enveloped world. And I will try to point out 10 which I find more attractive. They are 10 because I have 10 digits. Um, they could be of a different number and I'm happy to be told by some of you that those are not your top 10 if you prefer some others. And finally I will say uh, uh, very briefly something about the importance of design uh, within that context. So this is uh, with uh, all the background uh, out of the way. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about our time. Uh, what you see there is a, is a quick map for uh, beginners. Uh, that's uh, History 101, um, at least the first half. Um, the first half is the distinction between prehistory and history. Uh, this is not mine. Uh, is the distinction between any culture that does not have a way of recording the present for future consumption, normally not writing, uh, and uh, that is uh, what has uh, been normally uh, considered you know, the absence of ICTs, information and communication technologies. Uh, that is about 6,000 years ago. Um, we enter into history after that. Um, I would like to suggest that um, during that time, uh, individual and social well-being, our welfare, uh, was related to ICT but was not dependent on it. Uh, there's no Roman Empire or British Empire without ICT, and yet uh, those two empires were not so heavily dependent on it. Uh, we enter into hyperhistory, another fancy word for a simple concept, uh, once we have a society that depends on ICT for its well-being. And if you find that unconvincing, uh, here is the Bible for you, revise it slightly. Uh, those who uh, live by the digit, they die by the digit. In other words, cyber war is a good test for the hyper-historical nature of a society. If that society is hyper-historical, you know because you can actually harm that society by a cyber attack. So what happens in hyperhistory? Well, we have a lot of attempts to make sense of this transition. Uh, Cyberculture, posthumanism, singularity, and other science fiction scenarios of that sort. Um, they are valuable because they show, not in themselves, but that there's something that needs to be understood. Um, whether they are successful in their attempts, I will leave to your uh, taste. I will not discuss them uh, today at all. But what happens in hyperhistory is that we need to develop, or at least uh, the encouragement is to develop a new philosophy of nature, a different kind of philosophical anthropology, uh, a new political philosophy. There is plenty of work for philosophers, amazingly. Uh, the title of the book that was mentioned before, The Fourth Revolution, actually uh, refers to a philosophical anthropology point, which I would not address uh, today. But within that context, one feature that characterizes uh, hyperhistory is this 
enveloping of the world. So that is the general framework. What is this enveloping? Well, um, just a quick reminder uh, before we just get into the real business. Everybody in this room was uh, born outside their picture. Uh, for those of you too far away, uh, up here, um, there's uh, this little thing here is 2009 and 0 0.8 was the amount of terabytes that we had produced, sorry, zettabytes that we had produced until that time in the whole history of humanity since we stopped climbing up the trees and hide in caves. Now, between uh, that and uh, 2020, uh, those terabytes would have become 35. That's Reuters information. They might be wrong by, say, a large margin. It is still staggering. The amount of uh, sort of data that is present there, and I'm not saying information, and you should know that I know why I'm saying data rather than information, uh, well, that amount of uh, data will keep increasing. The only reasons to think that there is a limit are related to thermodynamics, intelligence, and memory. And I will not offend your intelligence by explaining why those are the three reasons. Um, there are plenty of problems with this huge amount of stuff that is circulating in our world. Uh, some of them are quite obvious. Let me just list them quickly before I get to the enveloping effect. Uh, there is an acquisition and storage uh, kind of problem. And for those of us not necessarily working in the philosophy department, this is a real issue. Usability, of course, all those, those data, uh, if they're not usable, they're pretty useless. Um, security and safety, and we come close to uh, something that philosophers might find of interest. Accessibility, because again, if they are there but you cannot access them, well, uh, analytics. Uh, the kind of black art that is being developed in several departments, but we're not quite sure what it is, who is in charge, what they're doing, and there's no such thing as a good paper entitled The Philosophy of Science Slash Analytics. Undergraduates are welcome to start. And of course, all that is regulated by law and ethics, and behind that, as usual, as always, there's the fundamental variable of money. Everything in that list costs something from the acquisition all the way down to ethics. So these are the general problems that we are facing with this massive amount of data that is hitting our world on a daily basis. And just to give you a little bit of uh, taste of what we have in our hands, again, just in case the philosophers were thinking, oh, this is not terribly interesting. Um, well, memory, for example, something that we have been discussing since at least Plato. Uh, our world memory is insufficient. Uh, what you find there are the most recent, although uh, quite old data about memory as in support, physical support of our data in the world being produced as we speak. It was roughly 2007 when we stopped producing enough memory. That sort of strange impression that actually you're constantly running out of hard disk space and your iPhone is not big enough, etc. Well, that is a world sort of uh, experience. Someone, somewhere, has to decide two things. What never gets recorded, and what, once recorded, has to be erased in order to make room for new data. These two decisions are going to determine the way we understand ourselves today in, say, 100 years, maybe 200. So this is just a taste. Uh, we will not develop this line of uh, discussion. Um, in case you might wonder, there is more of it uh, in the book. But I want to talk about enveloping, the fact that all this data and their memory and their problems are hitting ourselves like a tsunami. So um, we know that there's a, there's a lot of discussion uh, between the engineering approach to AI, the cognitive approach to AI, is really biological intelligence that we want to reproduce, no, it's really problem solving that we want to tackle. While we're discussing all that and fighting for the money behind, remember cost at the end, then there's always money uh, that uh, is going to play a role, meanwhile, what was happening in the 50 or so past years was something obvious, something simple, um, something that is uh, in the back of our uh, kitchen. We were changing the world to make sure that the world would cope well with the simple technologies that we have been able to develop so far anyway. So we have been adapting basically the world to the limited capacities, which are increasing by the day, uh, of AI. 
Um, I call that enveloping not because of any fancy word, because that's, uh, that comes from robotics, as many of you know in industrial context. An envelope in robotics is uh, also uh, known as rich envelope. It's the three-dimensional space that defines the boundaries that the robot can reach. You build an envelope around that little arm, because that arm is able to do one, two, and three. Building an envelope around it makes it successful. If you find this uh, slightly counterintuitive, uh, here is a homing example. First, a successful case of enveloping the world around the robot. The dishwasher, which I managed uh, after years of, of fighting uh, to have in the house, because I was the one who was doing the dishes. Now that is the most successful thing you can find in terms of simple mechanism and a whole world surrounding it. Now, the next is what I would consider, and here many of you may actually think I'm wrong, a mistake, wrong step, not the right direction. <coughs> it looks like this. It's someone who actually does the dishes like you, or more precisely, like me. Uh, we don't really know how to make that robot. Uh, or if we know how to make that robot, that robot doesn't drive. And if it drives, it doesn't sort of type. You get the picture. The is, I'm not saying that it's impossible, mind. Impossibility, now, if you have done any model logic, is a very strong word. Uh, but I'm saying uh, I wouldn't put my money there. I'd rather put my money here. That is an arm that puts the dishes inside the enveloped uh, environment. That is interesting because it's taking away, and mind, keep this in mind for um, a few slides uh, down the road in about 10 or 15 minutes. This is taking away my role at least insofar as I have to do that particular uh, uh, task. So this is the simple general idea of enveloping the world around uh, the capacities of the machine rather than vice versa. So in the past, enveloping used to be a standalone phenomenon like a factory or the dishwasher. The future, and the future that we're already seeing now, is enveloping the environment around AI so, uh, abilities so that we make the world increasingly AI friendly. And no wonder then the cars can actually go around without driver. Well, there's a lot of stuff that's going on anyway. And if anything, it would be wonderful to have a city built around those cars rather than vice versa. Uh, coming from Rome, I know that that is not possible anymore, but that's exactly what you would get from architects these days. If they have to build a new city, well, they try to make sure that that city is car driverless friendly. Because of course, it's much easier to tell the car where the traffic light is if you have thought about that before. Uh, and just no, to refer to an example yesterday, if the robot has to recognize the bottle, the easiest thing is to make sure that the bottle tells the robot, I'm a bottle, hmm? which is exactly what's happening now, these days, in, uh, among the best uh, wine uh, merchants, if you buy a good bottle of wine. So too much philosophy, too much speculation, well, that's Europe for you. This is uh, data from the digital agenda for Europe, and it tells you that about 20% of EU citizens, and that's the whole population of EU, they use a laptop to access the internet via wireless, away from home, or work. Where the heck were they? Well, in the street, Starbucks, you name it. They were inside the dishwasher anyway. They never left the dishwasher. So of course they are inside, and they are getting inside more and more comfortably because they are part of the system. It's the system that has uh, no, moved around them rather than making no, particular uh, adjustments. So this, I would argue, is a trend that is robust because it's uh, very resilient, it's cumulative, more and more uh, no, gadgets, more and more people with uh, smartphones, you get the picture, and it's progressively refining trend, a little bit like Wikipedia entries. What you actually have in the background uh, are some data uh, from uh, Sojedi uh, telling you how many people are around and what would happen if someone from Mars were to visit our Earth, say, in 2020. They want to study communication? Well, they focus on the 50 billion gadgets they're talking to each other, not us. I mean, we're just a, just a small minority of things they are actually communicating. By 2020, we will be way outnumbered by the things that are actually constantly moving data among themselves behind uh, the scene. Now, that enveloping the world, therefore, uh, and then again back to some fancy terminology 
for the philosophers among us who like big pictures, uh, has done something like the following. We used to have um, grandma walking inside a computer. That's even no, no, later than that. And she, in case, used to have a, a, a screwdriver to make sure that programming was done on the hardware. So she was walking inside. Uh, her daughter uh, walked outside the computer. We were talking 70s, 80s. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the very word desktop became a uh, synonymous for something that was no longer horizontal. Uh, that's weird, um, especially if you're born in a different age. And then uh, her granddaughter uh, walked back inside. Uh, for, to her granddaughter, computing is something that is happening around her environment on a daily basis. When she walks home and she looks at the modem, talking to, etc. If you do not dislike this picture, if you think that there's something to be said in favor of this different perspective about who is adapting to what uh, in terms of uh, smart technologies, or at least that there's as much adapting on their side as there is on the other side, what are the consequences? So what? Why should I be interested slash worried slash excited? I try to sort of, uh, provide a synthesis in the next half an hour or so, and those are the potential topics. And I try to provide some sort of memorable labels. Uh, whether I succeeded or not is up to you. Um, for those of you too far away, uh, if that is not readable, uh, we go from small patterns to zettabyte savvy, inscribing reality, green gabbit, shifting intelligence, a Roomba world, AIs in betweenness, replaceable interfaces, semantic engines, and cultural neo-dualism. Now we do have only half an hour, so I will speak progressively less as we go down that list. Basically because I assume that the further down we go in that list, the more understandable each bit will become. Basically it's a matter of uh, clarifying the background and the framework, so I will not repeat myself. So small patterns, that's about big data. You know, I mentioned the big data at the beginning and uh, why are there, what was the, what's the epistemological problem with big data? Well, I would like to convince you, as I have successfully done with some politicians and CEOs in Brussels, that the problem, epistemological problem with big data is small patterns. You wouldn't be collecting uh, those, all those data if it went for the fact that you need a lot of them in order to find a little tiny line. So something like this is the case. The real uh, problem uh, with big data is that if you have all those points, uh, you like to know what actually is lying behind. The more points you have, the better it gets. And actually, at this point, my wife said, you better tell some of the people that the next picture is called a telephone, because some of them we might have never seen it. But uh, since they're from the age of the population here, we should be on the safe side. So. This is why you need all those points. It's because then the picture of the telephone emerges, not for other reasons. Remember all those, that long list of problems caused by big data. You wouldn't so, uh, pay real money for all those problems to be solved unless you needed all that quantity of data because you needed to find the small patterns. So big data, small patterns, once again, a lot of philosophy for the non-philosophical people, not quite. Someone who got the epistemology of big data absolutely right is the uh, NSA. You don't have to believe me. Uh, that's a quotation from uh, General Keith Alexander. Uh, as he said, there it is. You need the haystack to find the needle. That's the epistemology of small patterns. Unless you accumulate all those data, those little needles will never be found. So. That's the idea behind the big data uh, problem. Remember, enveloping AI, smart technologies, so what? Well, because in order to, as we all know, mine uh, that uh, huge high stack, humans are largely insufficient. We need a lot of help from other artificial entities. With a problem, a problem that I want to uh, highlight very quickly in the next uh, few slides. Problem number one, small patterns, if that's the problem, unfortunately, uh, may be insignificant. Uh, Re-quoting something from the uh, advertising industry, you know that half of your data is junk, you just don't know which half, and that's why you need all those data. And the insignificance is gonna be a problem for anything that is vaguely smart. Two, 
Small patterns may be significant only if aggregated, but they need to be aggregated carefully. That example there that I hope you can read is been around forever, so again, it will be an insult uh, to your knowledge to repeat it. But it's basically, you know, when big data, small patterns make a mess with the young lady who didn't quite uh, inform the rest of the family that she was pregnant, while at the same time, Target already knew a sent nice products to the young lady. Now, those small patterns, therefore, you know, those 25 questions answered correctly so that Target knows exactly not only whether you are pregnant, but how far you are in your pregnancy. Well, those are small patterns that need to be uh, dealt with uh, very carefully. And of course, they need to be correlated. HSBC never realized that the same card, mine, was being used in Rio de Janeiro and in Oxford, they reimbursed the whole sum. And finally, for the smart technology people in this room, for the AI people, the awful nightmare, the significance of small patterns may actually be there when the data aren't there. That is a classic example from Sherlock Holmes. He solved the case because the dog did not bark. And nobody I thought that the non-barking was significant. Unfortunately, that's what information is for you. The value of information sometimes is there because, well, the information is not there. So just imagine having the high stack being the general and start thinking to your AI people, you, you better search very carefully also for the data that are not there because they might be very significant. I'm glad I'm not an AI expert because I wouldn't know how to deal with that uh, successfully, especially when the general is there. No. So all these ma small patterns, um, of course, uh, because uh, they require heavy mining and because there are pressing issues, military, safety or health related, no, you have all the data there, you might actually find a cure, you better be careful about what you're not doing with the data. What if no, the cure for your next uh, problem is there? You have a duty to etc. Well, all this happens at such a speed, at such a level, no, with such an extension, that of course all the sensible uh, small patterns are going to be touched uh, in a way that may not be ethically acceptable. Here is where I need to have a bit of extra attention because this has been a bit of uh, easy walk. So let, allow me to now ask you for uh, a bit of effort. What's the deal here? So you have your smart technology, is mining, mining big data, is trying to find uh, small patterns, some of these small patterns are sensitive. Uh, why do we have an issue here? Well, because um, as we know from physics, uh, don't need to introduce the gentleman there, um, uh, there's an infinite amount of information in any whatever bit of stuff you find in the universe. Again, I read for you guys, you seem to be too far away. It takes a computing machine an infinite number of logical operations to figure out what goes on in no matter how tiny a region of space and no matter how tiny a region of time. What's the connection with mining, big data, patterns, small, sensitive? Well, that applies, of course, even more to Alice. If you cannot figure out everything about that small particle at once, well, how can you possibly figure out everything no, about Alice? It takes a computing machine and infinite number of logical operations to figure out what goes on in the mind of a human individual, her preferences, wishes, choices, taste, etc. So what's the solution? Remember the general, the doctor, the big patterns, the small, sorry, patterns with the big data. What are we doing instead? But well, we do what we do everywhere. We uh, abstract, we generalize, uh, we treat tokens as types. We you know, decide that Alice is not really the real Alice behind, it's the Alice in front of you, that sort of uh, uh, fictional Alice. Because each individual is informational inexhaustible, we abstract, generalize, aggregate, interpolate, group together, classify, and therefore Alice is no longer that person. Alice is a young woman with allergy problems, a safer driver, a potential first uh, home buyer, etc. Again, why is that a problem? Well, because your smart technologies and the small patterns will end up by treating individuals as types. I, that's okay, I don't mind. Uh, I've been treated uh, worsely uh, in the past. But there's an inevitable loss of respect for the uniqueness of that person. So paradoxically, we are walking to a world where in order no, to make sure that our interactions, services, products are tailored to that individual, 
then we need to profile that individual. And surely you must perceive the paradox here that uh, the two things don't seem to go uh, together too easily. What's the result? Again, one step forward. So what? Here's the synthesis. And I uh, end up with the small patterns. Point number one. I won't spend, as I said, enough, uh, no similar amount of time on the, nine, the next nine points. Well, the risk that we are facing with smart technologies, mining big data in order to find small patterns, sometimes sensitive, so that the Alice in question becomes you know, a type of individual, is this. The profile, Alice in real life, becomes a profile. The profile is there because it's predictable. And the predictable is there because it becomes exploitable. Now, that is something that we would like to think more about before we do it. Uh, I'm not saying that that's a, a bad idea, but that's where we're walking uh, towards. Uh, so CAM must be exercising, extracting and handling the sensory patterns. Much more could be said, but I've already said enough about this point. You can see where the rest might actually go. So let me move to, back to the, those immense amount of data, the zettabyte uh, thing, the zettabyte uh, savvy. This is good news for those of you who actually voted when Vincent uh, provided that sort of uh, statistics in favor of uh, the superintelligence coming. Um, the gentleman in question uh, in the picture uh, is someone who can predict the future because he's actually going to make the future look like the way he actually predicted. Uh, that's the best prediction you can make. Uh, is the executive chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt. I hope that uh, the audio will work uh, because that's what he said about the Turing test. And Turing said that by the year 2000, we would have machines that had what the technique called the Turing test, which is you wouldn't be able to tell a machine from a human being. Uh, he was wrong. Will he ever be right? Um, he will be. So the test that Alan proposed is known as the Turing test is that you, you basically have... He's now going to tell you what the test is like, and he gets it right. Did you get that? Many people in the AI believe that we are close to passing the test in the next five years. Now, whether you believe that or not, whether you are on that side or not, notice one remarkable smart move. He didn't say he believes. He said many people in the AI community believe that. And I learned a lesson. Is that good news uh, in terms of uh, these zettabyte savvy uh, computers of ours? Well, um, I decided to double check just in case what was the result of the most recent uh, Leibner uh, contest. As you all know, uh, the silver medal, not, not, not the gold medal, the silver medal has never been won by anything. Uh, in fact, there's only a bronze medal, and the bronze medal is actually given not for passing anything, it's just for the, for the, the best of the worst. So basically, it's a wonderful competition because nobody has to win. As long as you are better than any other moron in, uh, uh, in the room, uh, you, you get a medal. And that comes with a bit of money as well. Now, this was a remarkable piece. I mean, this is the most recent 2013. I decided to run a little test. Uh, I was one of the judges uh, uh, at a Lubner uh, Prize uh, before. And um, when I discovered that uh, there was not real artificial intelligence at that time, but there was plenty of human stupidity. Uh, and uh, when I did that, um, I asked a couple of questions, which I thought I could ask again to the same software. I said, well, let's see what happens. Um, again, this might be a little bit tiny for some of you. I tried to make it as big as possible. But uh, here it is. I, sorry, Vincent. I, I said I was a PT AI now talking. Um, Question from uh, us, the human. What can someone do with a pair of shoes? Answer, quite smart. Well, quite a lot of things. Such as, for example, a tomato. Well, they say, wow, that's either it's very postmodern and uh, some kind of, <laughs> I know, uh, it, it beats me. Uh, or or uh, there's something wrong here. So, but let, let me try, let me double, double check, just in case. Uh, or well, anything else? Oh, that is all I have for right now, which is a decent answer too. You can get that you know, regularly from, from my mom. That would be fine. Uh, so I press a little bit more and I ask the same, same question I asked uh, years ago, second round. So what's wrong with the following sentence? The capitals of France are three, Lyon and Marseille. 
doesn't take much geography, eh? And uh, the answer was, how can there be self-help groups? Now, no matter how much postmodernist literature you have read, <laughs> Uh, this, this, this is smelly. I mean, this, this is fishy. I mean, it's eyes. You start thinking either this is a super smart guy who is actually pulling my leg, or there. I say, are you sure? Well, I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not so sure. Thank you, computer. And the answer was, uh, uh, you're quite welcome. What sort of computer do you have? I mean, I tried this uh, a couple of days ago because actually it came up just in time for this conference. Uh, and honestly, what a waste of time. But. That's what has won the prize 2013. Now, until I see something slightly better than that, I remain slightly unconvinced by the CEO of Google saying that in five years, this test will be passed. And I'm happy to be proved wrong at the next conference uh, when Vincent uh, will organize it. So that's, uh, that's the zettabyte savvy uh, computers we have around. Um, so what about AI? What, what kind of picture is actually emerging in terms of uh, AI in our world? Well, looks to me more like um, something that is uh, inscribing our reality. Let me explain uh, the uh, quick um, uh, play of words. This comes from uh, Simon 996, uh, the, uh, the Science of the Artificial, the, the third edition, and where he says, AI is not a science of nature or a science of culture, but a science of the artificial. And that's a lovely way of putting it. What does he mean? Well, it means that the AI does not describe the world, it's not like biology, and it doesn't prescribe the world, it's not like ethics either, or politics, or law. So, can we find a word? Well, you have it in the title already. But it's a Galilean, Galilean sort of, the Italian coming out, uh, a Galilean sort of perspective. You look at the book of nature, you see that book of nature written in mathematics, and what AI is doing is adding a new chapter. That's, that's what's happening here. So, in terms of... Uh, Representing, not representing, is a copy, is a copy. Is it copying well? Maybe we, you just have to shift a little bit and think in terms of, you know what, it's not describing, it's not prescribing, he's adding new stuff in the world. What kind of stuff? The envelope stuff. So, yeah, see what, what I'm getting. Uh, it comes, remember, with that list of problems, it comes with a cost. The no free lunch kind of idea. So that's the next point. Point number four, the green gambit that we are actually playing with all this enveloping and this big data and this more patterns, etc. That is uh, uh, the most recent um, uh, analysis of the impact of uh, ICTs at large, including non smart, of course, ICTs, <coughs> which are doing something good and something bad for us in our world. At the very top, here, is the advantage of having all that uh, smart technology around is the sort of good cut on uh, the impact that our technologies are having in terms of making life easier for the environment in the future. Because of course, as everyone knows, having had his laptop on his legs for too long, some energy has to come from wrong somewhere. Unfortunately, at the bottom, the black bit is the cost of that the increase, because of course that energy has to come from somewhere. And if you ever seen any documentary about Google or Microsoft or Amazon and where they come in terms of energy is staggering. So why calling this a green gambit? Because much as I like the idea that the market sooner or later is going to find an equilibrium, what I'm worried about is the later. Later than that. Later than is actually useful to have an equilibrium in the first place because there is no world to speak of? Yeah, that kind of later. That worries me. So that's, uh, that's the gambit for you. So a gambit for the known chess player, God forbid, I'm sure nobody's here, no, everybody knows what chess is about, but just in case, is a voluntary risk. It's not a mistake. Involves a significant loss, otherwise it wouldn't be a gambit. Um, is taken strategically in view of what is going to uh, happen later in order to gain a significant advantage that is basically not winning the game. In this case, it has to be higher than and compensate for the original loss. That's what a gambit means. And politicians use it very improperly, but no, that's the way they should be using it. So it's part of the logic of worse before better. Like this, that's the way it looks. You have a system A, you have some time scale, and the performance of that system, and that system is not doing well. It is going down and down and down, and it could be, say, Yahoo, for example, um, Hewlett Packard, you name it. Hmm? Or maybe not. But anyway, it's not 
really improving, you have a lot of uncertainty. What do we do next? What's going to happen? What kind of strategy can we take? At this point, you take a gambit. The gambit, if you remember, is that voluntary risk, etc., which make things slightly worse. They go down further. In a financial crisis, you uh, take cuts. In a military conflict, you have a surge. In an epidemic disease, you have culling. Animals were already dying, you kill more. Soldiers were already dying, you send more, etc. So that surely seems to be insane. Well, the strategy is that because of that, things will go slightly worse initially, but then way back. Remember, you lost a pawn, you won the game. That pawn was worth sacrificing. Now, what happens here is that time is the sensitive aspect of all this. You need to have enough time for this curve to work. If you don't have enough time, if the Gulf current, for example, flow uh, freezes up, well, there's no UK to speak of. And it doesn't matter whether the you know, so market will find a balance sooner or later, because that's true. You just didn't have enough time. I remember when I was at Wolfson a long time ago, we used to play squash, it? and there was this phrase on the squash court, I never lost a game, I just ran out of time. Well, exactly. So we want to win this game and we not want to be told by whatever you know, uh, ghost in the future that we ran out of time uh, despite being right. Next page. Remember, we got 10, <coughs> we just got four, but it's getting quicker and quicker. So uh, your attention should be still alive. Uh, Let's go back in time, 2008. Uh, you probably remember what happened in 2008, the Lehman Brothers. I mean, it was a very bad time. Was, things were going downhill. Um, so there was a bit of a depressing mood, like we're doomed, things are not working well. And guess what? Two articles you have read, but maybe you never put together, I don't know. But two famous articles came out in 2008. Number one, the end of theory, the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. Not sure whether the person in question still has a job, but uh, mm. so, uh, shouldn't have. Uh, not since having read Francis Bacon, honestly. But it was there. And uh, a little bit later, uh, in July, is Google making us stupid. What the internet is doing to our brains. What's the story here? Intelligence is shifting. Away from us, Google making us stupid, into the data. Uh, I'm not sure whether this has anything to do with the external mind uh, no talk that we had uh, before, but if that fits within that model, I disagree. Uh, I think that both points are wrong. Uh, they're wrong uh, <coughs> fundamentally, and this could be you know, a, a long uh, discussion uh, if I hope we have time, because what matters more and more is who and how is asking the right questions. The data there are an infinite number of answers for which we have not the right questions. Unless you have the right questions, you don't get the right answers. And it's not me, it's Kratilus, it's Plato. And nowhere is someone who knows how to ask and answer the questions. And we're still there. So Francis Bacon and uh, Chris Anderson uh, were wrong. And of course Google is not making us stupid. No more than my car is making me fat. It's actually what takes me to the gym. So. Shifting intelligence, therefore, not quite, not yet, but a Roomba world. Remember, we are enveloping this world around our artifacts. Uh, what happens if our artifacts are actually the, the ones... Um, uh, what happens if our artifacts are actually uh, the stupid but very laborious spouse in the couple? Now, we are the intelligent side, but lazy. You have the other spouse, Stupid, laborious, who is going to adapt to whom? How many times have we been told by the administrator, Professor, that's the only way the computer can do these things. So you better do things this way, because that's the way the computer will understand them. So who is adapting to whom right now? And this is not necessarily a big problem. I, my wife and I are planning to buy a new sofa with higher legs so that Roomba can you know, clean under. Uh, we are slightly adapting, that's not a big uh, problem. But you can tell where this is going. If someone is going to try to plan a whole city around the sort of cars that we're going to have, you know that you know, we are trying to make sure that the world is uh, IT friendly, as not necessarily opposed to, but as different from uh, human friendly. So a Roomba world might be in view at the moment. The next 
uh, point requires a few extra slides, but we are already on point number seven and getting close to the Q&A uh, time. I like to think of, uh, well, suppose you're not in Oxford, suppose you are in Rio de Janeiro, on the beach, hmm? almost. You wear a hat, you have glasses, those kind of technology. If you have a hat, you can think of that hat as something that is between you and the sunshine. A pair of sandals, the technology between you and the beach, the sand. If you're an analytic philosopher, the kind of sand there, that specific sand, it doesn't matter. So it's between you and the something else. You call the something else the prompter, you call you, the user, the technology is in between. And I think it's fairly okay. I mean, I'm not sure it's very controversial. If you take this picture uh, of technology in betweenness and you think of AI as a kind of technology, then uh, we can move to a next step, the a first order technology. A first order technology is something that is between you, the user, human, and nature out there. Uh, it could be, in the particular case, I decided to use a wood splitting axe, not because I use it regularly, uh, but because that seems to be something that you know, humanity has done quite a lot of use uh, in the good old days. So the, an axe is between a human user and nature. Let's call that first order in terms of uh, what is the other side, nature. Of course, nail clippers, assault rifle, they're all first order. Hmm? because the other side is nature anyway, the other human being you don't want to be too friendly towards. Then, of course, once you get the idea, you can move to a second order. What you move from is to have, on the other side, another piece of technology. And that's the way in which we can understand, for example, you know, the Industrial Revolution, modernity, the engine. The engine is between you, the user, and another piece of technology, let's say. So you get this second order idea, and this is just to prepare the uh, ground for a third order. That's when you are replaced. When technology deals with technology, that deals with technology. So it's technology throughout. Now AI is a typical third order technology. We heard the talk about autonomy, for example. Well, autonomy is exactly that. You don't need to be anywhere in the loop. In fact, you're not in the picture at all. And uh, this elimination by smart agents, which are no longer needed, at least in theory, well, or at least as a possibility, think of, uh, say, the markets going on for, say, a whole week without any human intervention. It looks like that anyway. Uh, but uh, that is the idea behind some of the more sort of uh, science fiction scenarios that we hear every now and then when it comes to understanding technology, quote unquote, taking over. It's not taking over anything, but it's a third order kind of technology. And mind, there's no fourth order, that's it, that's, that's the end of the game. You can't go any further than this. So this uh, seems to me uh, a case in which we can go back to the original picture, remember history and um, hi uh, hyperhistory, and look at history as the mechanical modernity. The time of the engine is when war, you know, in the uh, First and Second World War, was fought by sort of mecha mechanisms between humans and perhaps other mechanisms, uh, not necessarily other humans. So it is largely human dependent. You don't have uh, some kind of a Sherlock Holmes time, a Victorian kind of uh, age where humans walk out and the whole thing doesn't collapse. Of course it collapses. But hyperhistory, hmm, that's not quite clear. Maybe, just maybe, and I don't think I'm talking about science fiction scenarios here, there's just enough science around to make hyperhistory human independent. And we could imagine, you no, know, simple, very simple technologies that Mine get uh, the, the sunshine on one hand, the energy, they, of course they will break down, they will not repair themselves, and sooner or later the whole thing collapse. But for a little while, the whole thing could nicely, possibly go ahead uh, in and of itself. So the fact that we're not even in, uh, on the loop uh, is important to be understood for the next point. What happens when we are being replaced? And then again, uh, those of you who, with whom I have interacted in the past, they know that I really, really love science fiction, but I do not mix science fiction with philosophy. It's like liking no, vinegar and coffee. You don't drink the two together. Yeah. So I'm not doing science fiction here. Let's do a little bit of philosophy instead. And that's what I mean by replaceable. The guy there. Now, how many of us spend time doing that on a regular basis? 
we develop cars at a time and petrol stations at a time when making that automatic was impossible. Today, it would be absolutely idiotic. It's probably too late. There's one billion cars, one billion cars plus already around that uh, maybe they could do with uh, no, some improvement in terms of uh, uh, refueling. We just find it way easier to get the men in the picture doing it for us. But what's the question here? Well, you know, we can replace them. But mind, and that's the future of some AI. It's not going to be replaced by some kind of robot. It's going to be replaced by you. You are the one who's going to punch, get, pump, and go. You're not going to be served by that guy because that guy is too expensive. But the technology is there to make sure that you are going to replace that guy. So this replacement is a bit dubious. The lady in question, on the other hand, may more easily be replaced because the, she's just an interface between the GPS and the car. She translates the GPS into car uh, guiding around movements, and sooner or later we hope she will not be there in the picture anymore. So what happens? Well, first of all, you know by now that the car industry is the third industry at the moment in terms of impact of ICT, in terms of development. How, that's how much ICT industry depends on, on the automobile uh, production. But secondly, the fact that we often work as interfaces between technologies means that either if we are cheaper than the technology, there is no room for the technology in question. We are going to be the technology. It's much cheaper to get you, you know, at the pump doing the work, or we will be replaced, the GPS car. Uh, case. The picture at uh, the bottom is uh, an example of uh, a plan for a city which is uh, um, car driverless friendly. So ultimately uh, some people will be replaced, um, so AI may easily and rightly make us redundant. Uh, you'd be astonished if you were to find a gentleman operating the elevator these days. However, this may mean that uh, we might be asked to do more, not less, at least in this country, supermarkets are constantly and regularly replacing human beings with you, the customer, doing all the scanning of the food anyway and paying. There is no more anybody at a tilt. So we come close to uh, the end. Um, I've got two more points, but this will be rather quick. Semantic engines. Well, at the moment we don't have them. Or rather, we had them, but that's us. Uh, um, and what we have are smart technologies that can use semantic engines to do the job. So in this particular case, uh, what we have are syntactic um, artificial agents being able to organize things in such a way that the people involved can do the work for them. That's uh, Twitter, for example, using lots of graduate students to uh, disambiguate some tweets when necessary, some tweets. Uh, the case in question was uh, uh, Big Bird uh, some time ago, when of course the reference was to the US government, it wasn't to no, the particular puppet in question. That had to be done by humans. I'm not saying that computers will not be able to do it, what I'm saying is that's just an example. Other examples will pop up when basically computers will need to rely on human beings in order to do the semantic work in question. Finally, so what's happening at the moment? What is the impression? Well, the impression is that we are building a nice neo-dualism uh, in our culture, especially in our philosophical culture, as far as I can tell, going to different conferences. On the one hand, we have the data, the patterns, the syntax, the quantitative people, lots of philosophers doing that. And on the other, we have the information, the meanings, the semantics, the qualitative people. Uh, think of, for example, uh, say, formal epistemology on the left and hermeneutics on the right, if you are a philosopher. Now, this Dualism uh, can be bridged, uh, but more easily than anything else, it can be hidden. And I think that that is the interesting point. Not that that gap is taking place, because I think it is. Not that that gap will be overcome, because I think it will be. But because I think that that gap, by the enveloping of the world, the big data and the points I made before, was simply hidden to the view of most of us. We will just not see the difference anymore between you now the, the information, the data, the quantity and the qualitative, because things will just move seamlessly between the two. So we have done quite a lot of work uh, on a few points uh, that I promised I was going to illustrate rather quickly. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is rather quick. 
Remember, we started from the prehistory, history, hyperhistory distinction. Well, history as the age of humans, think of uh, the three musketeers and Richelieu sort of history, uh, as the information agents. Uh, that's when even the state is understood, um, possible Spalian system for the uh, political philosophers among us, is understood as made of humans. It's not yet the time when the state becomes an independent agent. But towards the end of the modern era, we started even considering the, the state as an independent agent, no longer in control. The first studies about bureaucracy, you name it. And then slowly, you know, the last uh, century or so, we've seen uh, a view of hyperhistory as the age of hybrid, multi-agent information systems from the big corporate to the markets, from the, no, the uh, state, now seen as an agent uh, to the NGOs. So what can be done? Well, and I come, I come to the conclusion, uh, with uh, less time than for Q&A that I thought we might have. I've been rather sketchy and superficial throughout, so I won't change uh, the approach, and I will be equally sketchy and superficial in the conclusion. I think that part of the uh, solution in all this is, apart from understanding what's going on and you know, trying to address the questions that we have seen uh, directly, is also rethinking the very role that design has in our society. How we design all these technologies, how we design the environments that we are building. So being able to see what the future will be like and what adaptive demands smart technologies will place on humanity, I believe is vital. In order to devise solutions that can lower the anthropological costs, remember Roomba world, and rise the environmental benefits, remember those two bits, the very green and the black uh, in terms of our environmental impact. Human intelligent design, and there's no pun intended, but I was misunderstood when I last spoke about this in the States. Uh, so human intelligent design should play a major role in shaping the future of our interactions with forthcoming smart artifacts. After all, it is a sign of intelligence to make stupidity work for you. Thank you.